Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a rising online star and chess ball author who I'm excited to introduce, and we'll do so in a minute as we return to the Adult Improver series. But first of all, I wanted to thank Perpetual Chess Patreon subs. Our recent subs include Christoph, Vic, Alex Solov, Chris Sharp, Jonathan Z, and Youngbin Park. Of course, if you join the Perpetual Chess Patreon com community, you can submit questions for guests, join the Perpetual Chess Discord, attend the occasional Zoom hangout or Zoom lecture from a titled player, and help support the podcast most of most of all. I also wanted to thank Chessable. Speaking of helping to support the podcast, uh, they've got a classic that just came to Chessable. Regular listeners of the podcast will know that Chess Structures is probably the most beloved chess book of the past 15 years, especially for intermediate players on up. And now... Uh, they have Peter Hein Nielsen, Magnus's trainer, um, doing the uh, video for it. So that's well worth checking out. Just a fantastic guide. And of course, if you sign up for Chessable Pro, use the link in the show description. Now, as for the order of the day, today's guest. So first of all, uh, she is. this is part of the Adult Improver series where we spotlight an accomplished amateur. Our guest has accomplished both in and outside of chess. Her name is Solveig. Freeberg, aka the rookie redhead. She got into chess via the Magnus boom, not the Queen's Gambit boom exactly, but she's from Norway. So saw Magnus on TV as he often is in Norway and started taking chess super seriously, got active online. Now she's rated 1570 FIDE and is also Twitch streaming. Had the interview, had the opportunity already to interview many top players. Outside of chess, she's got a background in education, making educational videos, and recently utilized that expertise for her course called Breaking 1000, which is geared towards beginner players like she was not that long ago. And I am excited to welcome to the program the rookie redhead, or I should say Solveig Freeberg, a.k.a. the rookie red, red, redhead. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Ben. And uh, I have to commend you on that uh, fabulous Norwegian pronunciation. Um, I feel very honored to be on the show. I'm a big fan of uh, the show. And of course, it's only recently uh, that I joined uh, the chess community. But I do know you've done a lot of great uh, work bringing uh, chess onto the podcast uh, platform for almost 10 years now. Uh, Amazing. And uh, helping, you know, bridging the gap between amateur to uh, professional level chess players. And also uh, recently when you're doing this um, uh, stuff for amateur chess players. Uh, I think it's very cool. So I'm very happy to be on, even though I'm a nobody, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, thank you. That's, that's very kind of you. And you are far from a nobody. And by the way, when I was saying amazing, it was the one she said almost 10 years. Not, not, not that this podcast itself is necessarily amazing, but I got longevity going for me, if nothing else. Um, but so big. So you've done a few interviews. Uh, so I've been following your story for years. You were on Chess Journeys um, uh, about a year and a half, I believe, into your chess journey. Um, and you were recently on the, the Shocksnack podcast in Norway. Uh, shout out to, to them as well. And you told your story of getting into chess via the Magnus boom, which is not necessarily, you know, that's not as common as the Queen's Gambit boom or the people who grew up playing chess, although you did learn from your dad as a kid. So I wanted to find out a little bit more about that. So you mentioned in one of the interviews that there was like 50% viewership share for uh, Magnus's tournaments in Norway. Now, do you feel like that's all of his tournaments or just sort of the world championships? Yeah, so... Um... I'm uh, a part of the Magnus boom. That's cool. I haven't heard it worded that. <laughs> I actually watched Queen's Gambit after I got into chess. I feel uh, a little bit so special in in that way. But uh, uh, of course, um, uh, to explain a bit how the TV broadcasts uh, work in Norway, they are um, yearly and they cover the uh, World Championship. And um, they did uh, this year achieve a 50% uh, um, market share on national TV in Norway. So that's huge, uh, especially if you consider that in the Norwegian Chess um, uh, Federation, I believe in 2022, there was 4,200 members. So that's not a lot. 6.5% uh, of them being female. So it's not like in, there's a huge amount of uh, chess players in uh, Norway by any means. And to achieve those numbers on TV, uh, it's definitely a testament to the work they have done. 
And of course, Magnus Carlsen is a huge part of that uh, because he's the he's the Norwegian champion. That uh, you know, also with um, with time, Norwegians have become increasingly increasingly interested in the other top players as well, not only Magnus. And uh, I do not believe that uh, chess would completely disappear from the Norwegian TV screen if, uh, let's say, Magnus retired. So, Ve, could you? Um, so, you said that it got close to fifty percent viewership on television, but only six percent or so um, of women play, and that chess itself only had forty-two hundred members in the federation. Is that correct? Yeah, the Norwegian Chess Federation and by 2022, it was only 4,200 uh, members and 6.5% of those are women. So uh, I'm not able to do the math, but uh, it's not a lot uh, by any yeah. means. So uh, it's definitely an achievement to achieve that number of years when there's not that many chess players in Norway. So... Um, so I mean, and of course, Magnus obviously has been a household name in Norway for more than a decade now. So why do you think it is that all of this popularity and so many people tuning in doesn't translate to more people actually competing? Oh, that is a very good question. Uh, I also think that uh, might demand a very multifaceted answer. Um, But I think... At least a reason why there's so many people that uh, watch chess on TV in in Norway is because uh, NRK is doing a really good job of making it very accessible to people. Because, you know, there is a little bit of this barrier when you don't know chess, uh, because you have this perception that uh, this is a, a highly complicated game. Maybe I'm not smart enough to get into this, all of these things. And uh, the TV broadcast, it's very in- inclusive and beginner friendly so you don't actually have to know chess to watch the broadcast and um, I think also a lot of people that watch it they don't really know the rules as well so it definitely makes it a lot easier Um, so integrating people into uh, actually playing and tournaments and all of these things I do think uh, there's a lot of uh, good work that is being done already I think uh, for me, I got interested uh, in chess because of this uh, TV broadcast. But the journey from from that spark of interest to actually started playing was not so straightforward f- for me. Uh, and as a newcomer, some of the biggest uh, challenges uh, I faced was just uh, finding chess people finding yeah. chess resources. For me, that was not easy at all. And it kind of felt like this was a, a sort of a hidden realm that was not accessible to me. So my first real exposure beyond Norwegian television was uh, through Gotham Chess and uh, Chess.com. And I do believe that uh, many others uh, share this experience along with me. And uh, I think uh, they're doing uh, a lot of good work uh, for integrating players uh, or those who have this that interest into actually playing. But I think there's also still much that can be done to more seamlessly integrate and welcome newcomers who are passionate about chess, but doesn't necessarily know where to start. Yeah, it's a big issue for sure. And I do feel like uh, chess.com and Levy uh, in particular are doing a really good job just uh, sharing their passion for chess. Um, So how did you eventually... I mean, I know some of the story from having heard prior interviews, but how did you eventually uh, find chess people? Yeah, it was uh, was, uh, definitely through uh, uh, Gotham Chess and Chess.com that I got this uh, introduction. And uh, then it was... It was a hassle, actually, uh, especially finding the Norwegian chess people. I had to Google around a lot. Uh, I found a chess club where they did beginner courses, so I signed up for that. And also they hosted an uh, event. I think it was Chess for Ukraine, where they had uh, a lot of uh, Norwegian celebrities uh, playing uh, and, and chess lectures. And it was kind of an event. And there uh, I managed to connect with some chess people in real life, get to coach, uh, all of these things. And uh, I was actually a part uh, of, uh, or I played chess for a whole year. I think I played chess for a year and a half before I actually found the chess people online. 
uh, aside from Gotham Chess and Chess.com. And I found you guys through uh, the Chess Journeys podcast because I asked there, where are the chess people? I can't find you. And he told me, you have to go on Twitter. The chess people are on Twitter. And Twitter is not a huge thing in Norway. Like none of my friends that are not into chess use uh, Twitter. So uh, then I got told about the chess punks community and how to get connected with people. And from there on, a new kind of world opened up for me online when I was able to connect with people from all over the world that were also, I don't know, the improvers interested in chess and all of these things. And uh, yeah, that was really great uh, finding you guys. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. It's amazing because Twitter, uh, aka X now, um, it's it's become controversial due to the actions of its CEO. And I feel like it was losing popularity even before that. But I do feel like the chess punks community is still going reasonably strong. So for anyone listening, um, you can just join that ignore all the other stuff. You don't have to argue about politics on Twitter if you don't want to. Um, and you can find people. But I'm curious, Solveig, because there are other, there's Chess Reddit, which is mostly like gossip. Um, you know, shout out to Chess Reddit. They, they, they have some amazing detectives there. But, uh, and they have some good like FAQs and stuff. But um, it, it doesn't feel like, to me, it's connecting people as much. And then, of course, there's stuff like the chess.com and chessable forums. And then there's Discord servers, although those you need to know which ones to join. There's communities like the Chess Dojo. But it does feel very fragmented. But I'm curious if you tried any of that other stuff uh, leading up to finally finding some people on uh, Chess Twitter. No, I didn't. Uh, it, it was mostly podcasts, uh, to be honest. So uh, when I started working on chess in 2022, uh, this was uh, not motivated by any uh, social media or content creation, nothing. It was just because I was in love with the game, right? And I set actually a New Year's resolution to learn as much as I possibly could about chess in one year. And from there on, there on, on I was very serious. I got two coaches. I studied really hard and I started uh, uh, joining, you know, classical tournaments and playing. So for me, this was not any part of online or nothing like that. But I did listen to podcasts and I listened to your podcast and I also listened to, it was actually my coach, Sheila, who recommended me to listen to Chess Journeys because uh, it's adult improvers, you know, so it was kind of relevant to what I was trying to do with getting better. And uh, I applied to be on the show. Uh, I sent in a Google form to be on just because I was a fan of the show. And I was declined or I, I, was, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, I was ignored. Yeah. So then right. so, so then I applied again. <laughs> and then he was like, okay, you can come on, you know. And uh, I, I don't think I would have found the chess book community or Twitter for a long, long time if it wasn't for that, because I didn't even understand how Twitter worked. I did have an account, but it was a dead account. Uh, so, so I asked him, okay, but I have a Twitter account, but how do I find chess punks on Twitter? I didn't understand anything. It was just too technologically advanced for me at that point. And he said, just put out a post and write hashtag chess punks. And I was like, Okay, so people are going to care if I put a post with hashtag GHS punks. I was a bit skeptical, but I did what he said. I put out an image uh, of uh, the night uh, on my chessboard. I wrote hashtag chess punks, and it got uh, thousands of uh, reach and uh, hundreds of likes and comments and warm welcome and welcome to the chess punks community. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. And I was just, oh my God, this is... This is the secret, I guess, to get uh, connected to the online chess world. <laughs> so, I mean, so no, I, I didn't try anything else uh, aside from that. Okay, I love that story. And for people watching on YouTube, uh, you can see uh, Solvig has a beautiful chess set in the background, beautiful classic wooden chess set. So uh, she had told this story before, and yeah, now holding up a piece. Um, maybe we'll get that in the uh, thumbnail. Um, but... 
So she posted this picture. And when you post a picture of a beautiful chest set like that, it's like posting like porn, you know, like a, <laughs> you know, like a picture of like a beautiful woman or a man um, <laughs> because uh, chess fans are just like, oh, look at that. I, I want yeah, one of those. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a great way to find a community. And one other thing I just want to add some some color to. So you, you alluded to having to prod Kevin, the host of Chess Journeys, a couple times to get on the pod. Um, but he, like I do, we both have forms on uh, Google forms that you can fill out if you want to be a guest. Um, but Kevin's because he interviews, you know, 90% amateurs and I interview probably 15% amateurs in terms of like, uh, how we, our guest distribution, it's, uh, easier to, to get on Kevin's podcast just, uh, due to the laws of numbers. But I admire your persistence because often Kevin on Twitter will be like, can anyone come on th this week? Especially because sometimes he has like a narrow window of uh, when to record. So I admire Solveig that you were willing to follow up. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, this is something that um, this is uh, one of the newest uh, lessons I have learned uh, in my life. And that is um, you will never get something that you don't ask for. Yeah. So just ask. And if you get a no, maybe ask again. Maybe they will say yes. I don't know. Worst thing that can happen is that they say no. And the best thing that can happen is that you get what you ask for. So just ask. <laughs> well said. Yeah. And you wrote in your Chessable course, uh, you wrote, quote, as an educator, I'm acutely aware of the learning pyramid, which indicates that humans learn best as part of a community compared to learning in isolation. So mm -hmm. I feel like your background may be framed um, a more fervent need for finding people than other people might feel. Do you think that's fair? Like, is that something that you see a lot in your non-chess work? Yeah. So for the people who don't know me, I work as the head of education in our study program. Uh, so nowadays I do mostly oversee, you know, quality, budget, research, uh, resource distribution, all of these things. But I work my way up there from being a teacher and also as a course creator for pre-produced uh, lessons for our students. So, you know, this give me or gave me, you know, a lot of hands-on experience with students and learning material, how people learn. Uh, and a concrete example uh, from my non-chess work, uh, I think that would be, <clears throat> we have a mandatory group pro project that our students must undertake towards the end of the second semester. And, you know, initially, a lot of these uh, students, uh, they request if they can, can I do this project individually? Because they don't want to go through the hassle of coordinating schedules without other people, uh, especially since we have a lot of adults with jobs and families that are uh, partaking in the study program. But uh, we just deny those requests because it's so important to do group projects and the study plan and learning outcomes and all of this, it mandates group work. So they just have to do it. And uh, what we find is that despite you know the initial resistance, uh, students usually, they do provide us with um, overwhelmingly actually positive feedback at the project's conclusion because, uh, and wishing, oh, I wish there were more group projects. So we, we really noticed this uh, shift and that is because they uh, report learning significantly from collaborating with other people uh, because you get multiple perspectives that does enrich the problem solving process. And <clears throat> when we work alone on something, it's very easy to get stuck in a single thought pattern or perspective. So these uh, group learning activities, you know, discussions, projects, uh, study groups, all of this, it does allow us uh, to benefit from each other's strengths and knowledge. And this collaborative uh, learning, uh, what we find is that it often leads to a deeper understanding and better also retention of information. And we are a social species, humans. We, we thrive in these uh, social groups. And you also have the theory of uh, social constructivism that uh, posits that, you know, knowledge is constructed through social interactions. So when you engage with peers, when you engage with the other people that are trying to learn the same things that you do, um, it can help uh, us um, refine our understanding and uh, challenge our preconceptions when it comes to the things that we are trying to learn. And I think this is very relevant to chess as well, because uh, when you're a part of a community, uh, it will support you, it will reduce isolation, 
that can come with solo study and especially with chess that can be such a a narrow thing that not a lot of people do being part of a community is so valuable and uh, also you know chess it could be a very emotional journey through those uh, losses and wins and being part of that community it can help with uh, reassurance empathy encouragement all of that is so important so i think it's just uh, collaboration is super important not only when you're uh, attending a university program but uh, also uh, when you're trying to learn chess, because it's not an easy undertaking at all, especially not when you're an adult with uh, families and um, other responsibilities. <laughs> Brilliantly said, yeah. And also, it's vital for sustaining motivation. If you make yourself some giant study plan, but you're the only one that knows about it, it's speaking from experience here, even though <laughs> I have plenty of chess friends, um, it's very easy to to drop off and, you know, kind of no one notices. But if you're part of a cohort or have friends doing the same thing, uh, it helps mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. So that that's um, with really, accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really well said. So but let's bring it back to when you did. Find, you've you've got a community, you've got a coach, and you said you know you love chess and you're you're studying two to four hours a day. Um, at what point did you feel like you kind of knew what to do in terms of how to actually study, or do you even feel that way now? <laughs> I feel like I have an okay grasp on what I should do to improve, but I must also say that recently it has changed a bit because of Tyler One, of course. Uh, I know you discussed uh, Tyler one a bit uh, in the recent interview that you did with uh, Levy. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm just so impressed by what he's done by just getting the reps in, uh, by playing a lot of chess. So because of him, I'm, I'm really starting to see the value of playing, playing yeah. a lot, you know? Yeah, it, it's hard to, to underemphasize or overemphasize, excuse me. Yeah. yeah, just just it's it's kind of counterintuitive because it feels so easy. It feels like you're not necessarily stretching yourself. But but yeah, I mean, you face all the decision points when you play. Um, yeah. And, and he's had amazing success, obviously. Yeah, and I think also Levy mentioned that in your interview and that uh, Tyler one might be a little bit of a special case because he doesn't seem to care as much whether he lose or win. So maybe also um, just playing more and trying to uh, de develop the resilience to not care as much when you, when you lose, you know? And uh, for me... Uh, it has been good to have a little bit of break from tournaments because I did a lot of tournaments my first year. I did nine tournaments where most of them were classical tournaments and I cared way too much when I lost. Like I took it yeah. a bit too personal. So for me, taking a step back, playing more online uh, and not letting it be the biggest factor in my life uh, it has helped me mature a little bit and not pout so much when I lose because you need to lose to learn. Yeah. And did you, obviously it, it's heightened, uh, emotions when one plays tournaments as compared to a casual online game. Did you overall enjoy the experience? No. Yeah. I didn't. And, uh, not because of anyone like uh it was a nice environment uh well i shouldn't just say no because i did enjoy parts of it uh and i had a lot of uh you know great experiences met a lot of new friends but it's just like overall the competition setting uh is not for me i feel like because i'm I like to compete with myself. I don't like competing with other people. I've never done it. Like before I was into chess, I was into horseback riding. Uh, now I'm retired, so I don't do horseback riding anymore. But I did some comp competitions back then as well. But I didn't like it because I become so nervous. Yeah. Um, I just feel like I don't have the stomach for it. So even yeah. in chess tournaments, even though I'm just playing, you know, silly uh, amateur tournaments, you know, there's no stakes at all. I get so nervous. Like I... I will struggle with sleeping the night before. Um, I get an uh, upset stomach. I just, it's, I, I don't, I, I, I like chess more for learning and studying and community. I don't enjoy that uh, competitive aspect so much. And 
that's a, but that's not to say that I won't do any more tournaments because I think they're really good for your chess learning, especially those with uh, longer time controls. Um, so, so I think I will do more, but but not uh, so intensively as I did maybe. Okay, yeah, and I, I think what you describe as a fairly common experience, and the fact you're going back also, like I think a lot of chess players might, might have a sort of love hate relationship with it. But and as I talked about recently with Elena um, in the podcast I did from the National Open, a short conversation um, here in the U.S. at least, and actually I know that you've got the chess bar in. Uh, in Norway as well, but there's yes. starting to be more sort of social gatherings of chess nights. And I think that that might be uh, here in the U.S. There's often sort of a generational split where people in their 20s and 30s, like a lot of kids play chess. And then people in their 20s and 30s, as they focus on their career and maybe starting a family, stuff like that, they might drop off some um, and then they might come back later in life. But I think that uh, stuff like more casual chess gatherings um, uh, might help bridge that gap. And I, you've done some work at the Goodnight Pub, right? Have, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, it was uh, uh, more like volunteering work. Uh, okay. We did. Uh, uh, my friend Sara. Uh, she actually does a lot of. Uh, she's she's a friend of mine from. Uh, we're in the same chess club. <clears throat> she does a very uh, lot of uh, good work trying to get more women into the club and into playing chess. And uh, we did uh, a Queen's Night at, uh, at the oh, Good Night. Oh, that's great. Uh, with and like, are you in uh, Oslo? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm okay. in Oslo. So uh, we did this Queen's Night where we just try to, because it can be daunting sometimes when you're a woman to go into an environment where there's so many men. So, so just to have those uh, female nights where there's just very low shoulders, you don't know have to, you don't have to know how to play, but we can teach you how to play. You can play with others that doesn't really know. You can get to know uh, like us who knows chess a bit. We can teach, talk a bit about yeah, uh, opportunities that uh, exist in the chess world with streaming and all of these kinds of things. So. So that uh, that is what I've done at uh, the good night, but uh, mostly I like to go there to to drink uh, <laughs> uh, ginger ale and uh, and play with chess. <laughs> um, and so, was this women's night? Was it uh, women only, or were there men yeah. there as well? Okay. Yeah, no men allowed. <laughs> okay, because I'm guessing on a typical night, it's kind of I w I wouldn't yeah. say 100 percent the opposite, but predominantly male, I would guess. But you know, it's so genius with the chess club because the location is so awesome. So actually in the street where the Good Night uh, Chess Pub is located, we also have this other bar with um, uh, with uh, retro games, uh, uh, like oh, an like arcade. Oh, like video games, yeah. yeah so so it's very fun. easy for people to go over, you know, uh, in the later hours uh, on Saturdays and Fridays and go over to the good nights. So, so then you will get uh, a lot of people that actually aren't into chess, into the chess pub. So, so that's very nice as well. Yeah. Sounds great. Sounds like a good night out to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so getting back to when you were uh, studying intensively two to four hours a day. So I, <clears throat> I know you've mentioned that, and you mentioned in your course that you did a lot of play and review of those mm -hmm. games. Uh, what else went into your study regimen? So uh, I got uh, two coaches, as I mentioned. So I did uh, uh, two coaching sessions a week. And I also did uh, a weekly classical game at uh, the chess club. And outside of that, I, um, I studied uh, what I wanted to study, but, uh, but also uh, aspects that I felt needed improvement that were highlighted in, in the coaching sessions. But... Um, if I could, you know, time travel and talk to myself with the experience I have now, I think I would have done a couple of things differently. But uh, but it's it's easy to say that when when you know a bit more. But uh, definitely, I put a lot of hard work in, and I think also what I managed to do in a year was pretty okay. Uh, I got to from not I. I I knew how the pieces moved, but I didn't know things like long castling and and so I was pretty green. Uh, but I got to, I think I got to like 1200 FIDA in a year. And I think that was pretty okay for being, you know, 
in my 30s and having a full-time job and all of these things. So, uh, but uh, this year, this year, uh, or like 2023, uh, first half of 2024, I haven't been so rigorous to study two to four hours every day. And I've been more focused on, you know, the course creation and content creation, streaming, traveling for tournaments. So it's kind of taken a little bit of a backseat, my own chess improvement, but I have improved. Like I'm I'm 15, 70 feet there. And, but you get a lot of things for free in the beginning. So, (laughs) but, uh, but yeah. Well, I want to say, I mean, I think it's really impressive to have a full-time job and start um, in your 30s and get to, to 1570 FIDE. Um, and it's totally understandable to uh, take your foot off the gas. So two to four hours a day is like, that's hard when you're working. Um, and obviously, as as we'll, we'll go into more detail, I mean, the fact that you've also built like um, a media career in chess, like on top of that is is all the more impressive. Um, but before we get to that, we did have a Patreon sub question. Uh, this is from Paul Cuesta. Thanks for helping to support Perpetual Chess, Paul. And his question was, uh, what are some common mistakes that beginners make and how can they avoid them? I think a common mistake that I also was guilty of myself was to focus too much on openings. Uh, Mm -hmm. and I know this is like the answer that everyone gives, but if I could time travel and talk to myself, uh, I would ask myself to spend that time I spent memorizing opening lines on uh, tactics or playing, but at the same time, uh, I think maybe it was a phase that I needed to go through because, um, when I started playing chess, I was so nervous. Uh, I was very scared to play chess because I was scared of making a fool of myself, blundering pieces in the opening. So, you know, uh, getting into these opening lines and all of these things, it kind of was like a safety net for me to put myself out there so I could portray in a way that I maybe knew a bit more than what I actually did. And, uh, but yeah, uh, all those lines that I spent so much effort memorizing, I've forgotten a long time ago, but uh, everything was not in vain because... uh, uh, you know, thankfully, my coach has told me if you're going to spend all this time uh, memorizing these openings, you should at least put effort into understanding why those moves are played. So I did, you know, gain understanding of the core principles of the opening, of things like rapid development and in- initiative uh, center, all of these things. So, I've, so, so it wasn't completely in vain. But if I had spent all that that time on on tactics and playing, I think I would be much stronger now. Than, than what I am. So, so so I think that would be my answer to that question. That's great advice. And that's inter- That's an interesting insight into the psychology behind it, because I, I feel like, and I wrote about this a bit in my book, like I feel like part of the reason that a lot of newer players, like they they get, as you say, everyone's heard this advice that, that they people might spend too much time on openings, but they do it anyway. And I thought it was just because there's an allure to it. And this might be true for some people, like, you know, they have names, um, you know, and you can associate uh, what opening you play might feel like a part of your sort of chess identity. But but the point you make about sort of uh, being able to present uh, superior knowledge, like feeling in control, mm. I think is is an interesting point as well. Definitely feeling in control. That's a big thing for me. And uh... And that is also at the root of uh, some of the things I need to work on in my own chest as well, like accepting you can't be in complete uh, control all the time. But yeah, uh, but yeah uh, definitely if you have um, memorized, you know, uh, the, the lines that you're going to play, you, most uh, you aren't probably going to blunder an officer in the opening <laughs> because right. you are you are on safe ground. So uh, that was a huge deal for me when I took that first step into the OTB scene after being only on chess.com and lead chess to actually go into the club uh, as a beginner and as an adult beginner, nonetheless, that was scary because you don't want to go there with a lot of people that you don't know. And you have this perception, these are very intellectual and smart people. And I'm going to go there and blunder an officer and opening. You don't want to do that, you know? (laughs) Yeah. 
Well said. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so you've recommended a few resources in the past. Uh, I believe you were a fan of uh, Hanging Pond's YouTube channel, who does great work, but that may feed into our uh, yes. our, op- our opening conversation. Yes, um, definitely. Uh, as well. Uh, what other resources? So it sounds like based on your updated recommendations of maybe some tactics, but all predominantly playing a lot and reviewing um, beyond your course, which is obviously helpful for getting one to the a thousand level. Are there any other resources that you would, you would recommend? Yeah, I am a big fan of uh, Chessable and I'm not only saying that because my course is on Chessable, uh, breaking 1000, but uh, I do generally think that Chessable is a good learning platform and it kind of caters to both the Uh, reader type of learner and also the video type of learner and I also think there's a great number of books that are on there Um, for example I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Arthur Yusupov series the build of uh, your chess series that's on chess pool but aside from that I also work with uh, tactics from scratch uh, from quality chess and I find that is a very that's that is a very good book yeah yeah fantastic Um, and here you discuss Yusupov so in Shaksnak, uh, your your recent interview there, you talked about some of the issues that women face in chess quite eloquently. And then mm. you at Norway Chess, unbelievably, are interviewing these top players. I say unbelievably only because you, you just got into the chess world in the past few years. And there was yeah. a clip with uh, Hakaru that, that went viral. Um, could you share the story behind, I mean, A, just getting to interact with players like that and B, uh, this particular exchange? Yeah, you know, I was I was very nervous to talk uh, to Hikaru about this. And the thing is, it's not very natural for me uh, to voice my own opinion in a strong way, because I feel like in, in the world, how it functions today, I feel like discussing, you know, political or social issues uh, can become very polarizing and it is a bit daunting, uh, because if you're putting your opinion out there, uh, people will share their opinions and it's not always going to be nice, you know? Um, And also I find this is a very neat balance that needs to be, we need to strike a balance here when we talk about these issues. Like, for example, when I talk to Hikaru about uh, uh, how things can be for women sometimes in the world of chess, I think if we talk too much about it, it can deter women from joining the chess community because they're like, okay, but if everything is so bad, why should I join? And then on the other hand, if we never talk about it, uh, things will never change, you know? And and also, um, I think it would be helpful if supportive men also talk about these things sometimes without women being part of the conversation because then we don't have to be labeled as complainers or nags. So, because there are a lot of supportive men in the chess community. And and that is something that I actually really want to highlight is that from the years I've been in chess now, it's been two years and the reception I've gotten from uh, men has been really great. It's been positive. And I met so many uh, good guys, Uh, uh, you know, Andras, uh, you, Neil, Bruce, you know, uh, Gert, chessable people, like people are so nice. The men are so nice. And I think it's important to highlight that as well. And not only the negative stuff, but, uh, but the thing I reacted most to, and I know, you know, that because you, you watch that clip and you listen to the Shaksnack podcast, but for me, I react very to that. Uh, it, it's, I find it surprising that there's still talk uh, about women not being as good as men in chess due to their IQ or their brains or their intelligence. I, I find that very surprising that this is a conversation because I've never heard people talk about this before uh, in my life and in the professional world. In other realms, if yeah. You, yeah, if you, if, you, if you had statements like this, uh, you would be called into HR. Uh, you would get issued a warning. Uh, and it's also surprising for me uh, after having talked about this a little bit for the first time, uh, the number of guys who believes this is a non-issue, that this doesn't happen. And and from that, I would just say, read through the comments on the Hikaru video <laughs> on yeah. my Twitter account uh, and, and see what people are writing. Uh, because, you know, just because 
you don't hear it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And um, but uh, talking to Hikaru about this, I was so nervous, you know, because interviewing is not my profession at all. I'm not an interviewer, and approaching people like this, it's so out of my comfort zone. You know, I grew up in a small town in Norway. Uh, we show respect by leaving you alone, basically, because we right. value privacy. So I'm like, okay, I want to show you respect. I leave you alone. So when when you mix that with being an inexperienced interviewer and going up to these uh, big chess personalities, that makes for a very interesting cocktail <laughs> for an <laughs> interviewer. And you can very often get rejected as well in front of camera crews and huge numbers of people where uh, the top chess player just basically just ignores you or just like, I don't want to talk to you. And this can be, you know, really, really uh, mortifying <laughs> when this happens in front of a crowd. So um, I was, you know, kind of my job was to ask Hikaru about the world record attempt. But I had decided that in addition to that, I wanted to ask my own question. Uh, and that was uh, related to this uh, women's issue uh, with the discussions that are going on about intelligence and all of these things. And, and it was a reason It was a reason I chose to ask Hikaru about it. Uh, and that is because I know he has collaborated with women, uh, you know, his wife being this a top chess player. I just genuinely have the impression that he uh, is a good person, that he cares about women and he didn't disappoint at all. And he gave a really good answer. And I think that answer uh, means a lot uh, to girls and women that see that answer. And that was the motivation to ask as well. Like, even though it's scary, it could mean something for them to hear that from him. Because it, it means more when he says it than when I say it, in a way. Because he is who he is. So I, I was I was really thankful that he answered in the way that he did. And if I see him yeah. again, I'm probably going to get starstruck because uh, I, I have the impression now that he's just genuinely a good person. So uh, it was it was very positive. Glad to hear that. And just for context, I'll read what he said, but also just wanted to uh, interject that when, when you mentioned the world record, you're referring to the guys from Shaxnock playing for, I believe it was 61 hours straight. Is that right? To uh, yeah, they played break the record for consecutive chess. Yeah, they played uh, Blitz Chess for 61 consecutive hours. They're crazy. <laughs> Amazing. I bet someone's done it like, uh, I bet someone's done more than 61 hours. Like um, uh, German One, the Lee Chess one minute player. Someone like that has done it on their computer without anyone ever knowing. But uh, but it's still amazing <laughs> to do it in real life. But uh, here's what Hakaru said when uh, when Solveig asked him about it. He said, there are, quote, there are underlying issues that have nothing to do with how smart you are. There are culture issues. So if I were talking about girls, I would advise to compete, to be positive and tr to try to find like minded people because it can be very difficult and very lonely when so many people can be against you. Try So try to play and try to be positive and ignore all the haters. Mm. Yeah, and did you prompt him answer. at all or did you just ask him out of the blue? No, I prompted him uh, in okay. a way uh, because this is also scary because he's there playing and then this yeah. person that he doesn't know, I, I came with this ridiculous microphone because we didn't have professional equipment and people actually commented on this on Twitter. It was so funny because if you see that clip, you're going to see this tiniest microphone. It's so ridiculous. So you can see this person okay. you don't know comes running with this stupid microphone. Uh, <laughs> I felt like, okay, I need to prompt him in some way so that he's not caught off guard. Uh, so I just said, you know, uh, Hikaru, do you have uh, do you have a minute for for a quick question for the girls and women that follow you in chess? I said. Uh, so then he kind of knew uh, it was going to be related to that at least. But okay, Excellent. if he yeah. had, if he hadn't been comfortable asking, I wouldn't have posted anything. So okay, yeah, and I'll put a link to that for anyone who hasn't seen or wants to see. Uh, the actual clip. And what was the experience like working at Norway Chess uh, beyond that one interaction? Yeah, so I was actually working with the Shucksnack guys uh, covering the world record attempts. I wasn't really associated with um, uh, Norway Chess uh, beyond that. So I wasn't hired to do interviews on anything. I just, uh, yeah, uh, asked them uh, if they had time for some questions. 
So uh, it wasn't in the regiment of every, anyone. Uh, but that kind of tracks back to what we said in the start of the in, uh, interview that we are doing now, that uh, you just have to ask because yeah. the worst thing you can get is a no. So just yeah. put yourself out there and ask. And I must say all the top players I talked to were so nice. Uh, uh, I also got to talk to Fabiano and uh, he was just like the sweetest. <laughs> He was so nice. I was uh, really surprised by how nice he was. Not that he doesn't look nice, but he was just really nice. Yeah, and and to your point, that makes it uh, the fact that that you weren't there, like officially with Norway Chess, makes the whole environment all the more intimidating. So I'm glad yeah, to definitely. hear that uh, that you were treated uh, kindly. Um, well, so big as we start to wrap up, uh, I thought it might be helpful if you could share sort of a few highlights from your course of like, um, so it's called breaking 1000, but w what are the sort of fundamental tenets? Like what is the thesis of the course? So, uh, this is kind of, uh, a way to try to bridge the gap for the complete beginner to, uh, uh, you know, the wealth of the amazing existing study material that is out there. Because uh, when I was a new player, I struggled a bit with the, like even, you know, the build up uh, your chess series. It, it's like from, from rating zero to 1500, but it's like I'm 1570 now and I still struggle with the yeah. exercises yeah. in that book. So, you know, uh, and even, you know, books that are for children, uh, like they're framed, like they're, they're very, very easy, but you know, they're actually not that easy for the complete beginner. So, so this is why I was asked to do this course, uh, by Chessable. I even had that question when they asked me to do a course, like, why do you want me? I'm not a titled player. Uh, I, I am a rookie, you know, I haven't been in the chess world for a long time. And they were just like, uh, there, there is, there is an audience that, that needs, um, a bit of support here uh, with this uh, boom that has been, and uh, especially when you're an adult and you're going to learn chess, uh, it's not that easy actually. So, so the breaking one thousand course it is specifically geared towards those who want to break one thousand rating and and really help guide them through and explain the whys uh, behind every single thing. Like the course almost has sixty thousand written words. It's uh, it's it's book length. So, and that is because I'm trying every single step, uh, explain every single why, no matter how stupid it is. Uh, because through my streaming, uh, I've been very fortunate to do, uh, a lot of Twitch streams with, uh, title players and, and, um, just, uh, sharing some of the lessons that I've learned from them in a more, uh, di digestible and beginner friendly way. And also having that done by someone who very recently were in their shoes, but also has experience uh, as an educator. Um, Chessable thought that would be uh, a good a good mix. And uh, and we're going through uh, kind of a little bit of everything. Like we're going through a healthy openings, tactical arsenal, uh, aggressive checkmates. We're going through a middle game, end game. And we also have a, a chapter that is um, how to study. So with a complete study plan and tips to how to get out playing over the board, how do you analyze games? How should you solve tactics? Uh, how, what should you focus on when you play? What kind of time controls? And, uh, my, uh, coach, uh, international master, Peter Haugli, that I worked with my first year has done intensive, uh, peer review, uh, of, of the entire course. So it's quality assured by Petter. And we have also discussed uh, things like the study plan and, and things like that. So I have had, uh, you know, input uh, and help with the, with the quality assurance from, from, from uh, I am uh, Petter Haugli. But um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a very uh, positive reception of the course. I'm very happy for that. And uh, also we have a very active uh, community on over at the Breaking 1000 course forum. Uh, we do uh, streams that uh, helps elaborate on topics in, in the course. And that is because I believe it's important to foster this sense of community, like we talked about earlier. If you're going to learn, it's important to do it together with someone. So um, it's been it's been a lot of fun working with it, and uh, yeah, the Chessipello community is very very positive and uh, and uh, and warm. I would say. 
Well, congrats on your success. You know, as as we record this, I'm uh, I'll be recording my first chessable course next month, uh, late July, and I'm still editing. And I I, I know how much work goes into it. <laughs> I'm learning oh, the yeah. hard way. So uh, yeah, and the, the 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 team does an amazing job giving feedback and helping you make it better. But um, but as you say, the reviews of your course have been great so far. And yeah, I I was particularly I liked the. Uh, the how to study chapter in, in particular yeah. that you mentioned. Um, and, so that was, uh, uh, that was actually, uh, um, one, uh, that was an addition that wasn't really intended to be included in the course, but, uh, of course the courses are, uh, beta tested right. and, uh, and, uh, we had beta testers on the course and, and they pointed out that, you know, breaking 1000, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty uh, you're you're promising something with that title you know and uh, and to not have that chapter like how to study it that was just a giant hole but you know when you when you sit and work with something for a year uh, it's so easy like we discussed earlier when when you work kind of in isolation in a way you get so right. stuck so so to have that perspective from the beta testers and and really um see where they were coming from i i put on an additional chapter uh last minute <laughs> so it was a lot of extra work but i think it really enhanced the course and uh, i think it would be great for for those who who want to beat uh, a couple of uh, old foxes on the chess club or <laughs> bitter dad yeah. or a family member yeah and Finally. yeah and i just got my feedback from beta testers as well and as you say they're invaluable so shout out to them uh it's <laughs> yeah extremely helpful yeah um, definitely b- because it is like you're you're just kind of in this uh, this vacuum and you kind of you know you don't know what you're not presenting that you should be and stuff um, yeah definitely so, last thing i wanted to hear about Solveig is uh the twitch streaming so i know you're 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 taking a break from studying intensively but is that still, given your, your all your other responsibilities, is that still a priority for you? Yeah, like uh, I'm, I'm very excited to get back into my own chess improvement. Uh, to be honest, uh, um, after finalizing the chessable course, it's been, of course, I have a. Uh, uh, through writing that course, I've also, <laughs> I think, uh, improved uh, my own skills because you learn so much from teaching others. But uh, I'm really excited to go into into my own chess learning and and really try to reach that uh, next level and and stream along the way and continue to do uh, streams with title players for the Breaking One Thousand audience. Uh, the next one will be with uh, Robert Ramirez. I don't know. He's also a chessable author, a national master. And we did one recently as well with uh, chess coach Andra, uh, Andra Stoff. So, um, so that's really great because, you know, there's not everyone who are able to afford coaching. So to be yeah. able to stream some coaching lessons uh, for free, I think that's very valuable for the adult improvers out there to to help spread the, the knowledge. And uh, and definitely I learn a lot from it as well. So I really enjoy doing that. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoy streaming from more this serious learning perspective. Uh, not so much uh, just uh, for having fun you know of course it's fun yeah. but but i like to get some serious learning in there so um you might not be the biggest streamer but when you go that route but uh, at the end of it you need to enjoy what you do to be consistent so so yeah well said and do you ever stream in norwegian or only in english I don't actually. Well, I was asked to broadcast the Norwegian uh, championship, uh, and uh, and then we streamed in Norwegian. But uh, but I think like like I said, the Norwegian Chess Federation it has four thousand two hundred members. So uh, so I think if you're you're streaming then in Norwegian, you are really catering to a very small audience. And I think the uh, the chess community as a whole, uh, like the international one, it's small enough as it is. So. I think it's better to do it in English and also it feels more inclusive because there's mm. a lot of people who don't talk Norwegian and even in Norway there's people who don't talk uh, Norwegian. Oh, so wow. so so it's not very inclusive to do it in in Norwegian I feel. So I think it's better to do as much as you can in English and even the Shaksnack interview I 
us to do that in English, even though we're all Norwegian, to make it more inclusive. So I, I think I think that's better. Wow, I can't get over that 4,200 member. I mean, I know Norway is a small country by population, but still, that's tiny. You should uh, look up. Then, uh, you should look up the number of uh, active uh, female players in Iceland. I, I saw that number recently. I was very surprised. Uh, I think is it's it very low. A lot or a little? Low. Very, very low. low. I don't chess remember is exactly. Popular there. Yeah, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was like fourteen or something. It was like incredibly wow. low. So we we need to get some more women in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're certainly doing your part, Solveig. Uh, really appreciate. Um, all, all of your contributions, you've really, I feel like you've, you've sort of, uh, um, blazed a path, uh, for, for other women like yourself entering chess as working adults. Um, so, so thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I've enjoyed this so much. And yeah, like I said in the beginning, I'm very honored to be on the Perpetual Chess podcast. Uh, you have some amazing guests on. So so to be on the episode, is, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful. So thank you a lot for, for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And the course is called Breaking 1000. And we will link to your Twitch as well. Your YouTube is basically not really happening anymore. Is that is that fair? No, it's it's just... kind it's kind of dead. Uh, but it, I might try to review review it. I can't talk. I might try <laughs> to I might try to do something on revive, YouTube later. Yeah. But yeah, revive. Thank you. But it's uh, it's mostly on Twitch that happens, and also on X and Instagram. So I'm I'm rookie redhead over where everywhere. So. Yeah, should, great should name. Even though, as as the Shock Snack guy said, <laughs> intermediate redhead just doesn't work as well. But <laughs> intermediate but, redhead doesn't work as well. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to steal that joke from them because it's pretty funny. Um, all right, so Vague, Well, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great to talk to you. 